Welcome back to GameSpot's E3 2018 coverage. I'm Callie, and I'm here with Senior Vice President of Bethesda, Pete Hines. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello, how are you, Callie? I'm doing well. How's your show going? Crazy, but good. It's Busy. Uh, pretty packed, especially judging by the press conference. Seems like it started a little bit earlier than you guys necessarily wanted, judging by that Walmart Canada joke. Yeah, yeah. Man. But you know what? We were still planning on teasing it and putting out so we just sort of rolled with it and oh, made so, the most of it yeah so that was planned just yeah before the showcase we were actually oh. the monday when we actually put out the trailer was when we planned to but they just leaked mm -hmm. it a few days early so my team is awesome and they're like oh we're just gonna have some fun with it and roll with it i was gonna say you guys had a really good sense of humor on twitter about that well, i mean video games are supposed to be fun and mm -hmm. so whenever you have a chance to have a little fun you should so we decided to and it worked out yeah um, one thing I noticed about this year's press conference was, you know, compared to last year, you guys showed off a lot of stuff that was coming out in the months following. So it was a big 2017 showcase. This one had a little bit more for the far future even. Uh, can you talk a little bit about maybe what the thinking was behind that change? For sure. Well, if you look at what we had last year, like we just had a ton of games. We just felt like with everything that we were releasing that year that we honestly could afford to keep it the focus on last year mm -hmm. with Wolf and Evil Within and you know, uh, Nintendo Switch games and VR stuff. So it was more just like, how much do we have? And for this year, again, it was like, where do we feel like everybody is? And, and what do we want to show? And what, what do we want to announce? And, um, and, you know, in the case of Bethesda Game Studios, we wanted to give, I think, a better sense of, of what their longer term plan looks like, not just Fallout 76, but future stuff, just because there was rumors and things floating out. And we were just like, let's just tell everybody, like, this is what it looks like make life a little easier and as a result you get a pretty big mix of things for this year things for next year and things for beyond that mm -hmm. so i guess jumping into one of the biggest things was elder scrolls 6 which is the one that i was hoping and praying for um is there anything else you can can tell us so is it is it in development is what's going on like what's going on with that i don't even know what stage you would categorize it in right now um we are obviously full bore on fallout 76 um, and as Todd has said, um, we're, we're a fair ways along with Starfield. I mean, it's playable now. So, like, Fallout 76 gets the bulk of the attention, and Starfield has some amount of attention. So, Tez 6 being much further down the road and, you, you know, some number of years after right now, you know, pre-production, it's, it's early. Mm -hmm. For Starfield, then... If that one's a little bit further along, when can we expect to see more of that? Uh, probably a lot closer to release. Again, like mm -hmm. it's definitely further along, but even across Bethesda Game Studios, which is now three offices in Rockville, Montreal, and Austin, the bulk of those folks are working on 76. It's a massive project. It's a massive world. And so, you know... Uh, Starfield is going to still need some amount of time and attention after this year um, to get everything else that it needs because it's an incredibly uh, ambitious project. Mm -hmm. For Fallout 76, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, we've got to, gotten to talk to Todd Howard already about this. Um, and so I'm just wondering what your take is on the, you know, online multiplayer emphasis, especially for something that is traditionally a, a pretty single player driven, uh, really like story heavy RPG. In terms of like how that's going to affect how you play, yeah, or, like, or how that how how that affects you know somebody's perception of Fallout, or, or how that does that evolve Fallout in a way, or is this kind of a separate thing um, from the main Fallout? Both, mm -hmm. like uh, you know, it, it, it's it is a sequel, and that is the next one in in Fallout, uh, but we didn't call it Fallout Five because it's not it's not the same. We are doing something different, and we are doing something that that was a direction the studio wanted to try and see how it worked and see what it would feel like. Um, I think as folks get a better understanding of, of what it is, it's still at its core a Fallout game. You're still doing all of the things you would do in a Fallout game if it was, if it was an offline single-player game. Developing your character, going on quests, exploring the world, like the emerging gameplay, what's in that building, what's over there, I'm going to kill those things, and I want to craft stuff, I want to trade for things. Um, all of that is still true. You just had this added element of when you see a person in the world, they're a real person, and now you have to figure out not how did we script that character to interact with you, but that's being controlled by a real person who might be role-playing or doing any number of things. Maybe they're being super helpful. Maybe they're wandering the world as a trader and just trading with people. Maybe they're 
being a bad guy and like they're consider they're part of a raider group. Um, so allowing for that sort of tension, but with with systems in place that keep it from being abusive. So you can't be you can't be harassed by somebody who just keeps chasing you around the world and keeps killing you over and over again. Like the game literally doesn't allow you that that to happen to you. Um, and you don't. Death isn't supposed to be a super negative thing. Like you don't lose your progression. You don't lose all your stuff. Somebody can't kill you and then take everything in your inventory and you start over. It doesn't. It doesn't work like that at all. And I think once we figure out some things, we're sort of like tweaking. Like well, maybe it should work like this or this. Um, the, when you see it in action and when you play it, when you feel it, it just like it feels like you're playing a Fallout game. Mm -hmm. um, I play it whenever I play it. I play it always by myself. Like I, I don't group up with folks. I, I just like going around and seeing how does all of this play out and and how does it feel when you're playing it. And so far, like I, I really enjoy it. I love it. So it's like the same sort of uh, role playing that you would experience in Fallout, just in a different sort of style. Yeah, I, I think of it like all of those interactions with NPCs that you come across have traditionally been entirely dictated by us. We decided whether that was a bad guy or a good guy or had dialogue. And now you don't have any idea. And so in that way, it does feel more like I just came out of this vault into this world. And I don't know how anybody I come across is going to interact with me. Unless maybe I've interacted with them before and we've traded stuff or, you know, they were looking for X. I was looking for Y and we and we bartered. But maybe now they've they've turned bad, and they, right, it's still always going to be a question in your mind of how am I gonna am I gonna set up a shop with a big neon sign that says guns for sale, or uh, all of that is entirely up to you, and it's also not it's not set in a place where um, you know I, I'm playing the game by myself and you're playing the game by yourself, and we decide hey let's let's join up and play together. It's not like well can you join my server? Like it doesn't it doesn't matter. You can just see go to play and go oh I see Pete's playing. I'm gonna jump on with DC Deacon into wherever he is, and now you're just in the same place that I am, and the stuff that you did comes with you. Or you have multiple characters, and you're like, this is the one that I use when I'm playing with this group of friends, and this is the one I play when I'm just solo, and this is my good guy character. All of those things are still possible. That's awesome. Um, one thing I do want to go back to really quickly before we move on is the anti-harassment stuff. It sounds like uh, there's a lot of tweaking involved, a lot of you know trial and error with that. Do you have plans to continue monitoring those systems oh, after sure. launch? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a... It, we look at lots of things. I mean, Fallout 4 and Skyrim are games as a service for us, right? They have ongoing support that, that we provide for them. This is going to be that to the umpteenth degree where we're constantly checking and monitoring. You know, Todd talked about the beta. We need to see how folks react in that and how it feels. But again, think of PvP more like issuing a challenge to somebody as opposed to just no matter what I want to do to somebody, I can. It's more like issuing a challenge and the Game only lets that go so far before you can basically say, I, I don't, I don't want to participate in this challenge anymore. Oh, that's really cool. So you can essentially like tap out. Kinda, yeah. Like think of it this way: if you were just playing Fallout 4 and you were exploring and came across a death claw, and you'd be like, hmm, I don't know if I have the weapons to deal with this, or if I'm high enough level, but I'm gonna try. And you try and fight it and die, and you respawn. You might say, A. I'm going to try it again because I came close and I want to kill it. Or you might say, I didn't even come close and I'm done and I'm going to go do something else. Like, well, that should kind of be how it works for any human person where you're like, oh, I want to get my revenge and try again because I think I can take them. And you're incentivized to do that. But you could also say, I'm good. I'm all set. I'm going to go do something else. And they can't keep coming after you just like that death claw wouldn't come running across the map and keep chasing you. Like, it should feel like it should feel like that. Right. Um, so I guess on the Fallout note, but a little different, uh, you guys just released Fallout Shelter on PS4 and Switch. Uh, I think understandably, because Fallout is uh, a big deal for you guys this year um, with 76. But I'm wondering about uh, Elder Scrolls Blades and if the success of Fallout Shelter, which uh, Todd said uh, 120 million players, which is more than all of your games combined, which is incredible to me. Uh, did that influence uh, Elder Scrolls Blades at all? Absolutely it did. Uh, it, it not only informed it, but it, it told us a lot about what we needed to do to make Blades a better game and how to do that properly. And quite honestly, a lot of the folks who made Shelter happen have been the folks leading the charge mm -hmm 
on Blades. You know, they've got um, a lot of experience in mobile. That's what allowed us to make Shelter a success. And, you know, it was rolling off of that where Todd was like, okay, like, I want us to go big. Like, we've been kicking this idea around and, like, we're going to go for it. Like, I want to do... And, you know, he laid out sort of what that looks like and feels like, starting with mobile, but eventually coming to basically any platform that we can put it on, including all types of VR. Um, but to have that same kind of experience of, I, I don't have anything quite like this uh, on my on my phone. Mm -hmm. And for Elder Scrolls fans, um, I mean, I know for me, I'm the kind of person when I get really into a game, I like to read the wiki on my phone just to, like if I'm like I can't be playing right now I might as well be reading about it or something like that and so that's the kind of game that I would want to have with me yeah so for sure and it, it and it does offer a variety of experiences I mean he talked about yesterday you know the town mode is the, is basically the base game that is the story of you're one of the blades you get um, sent back to your town it's in ruin and you have to build it back up and in doing so you're doing quests you're going out adventure you're leveling up your character you're getting new stuff you know this is you know my favorite part because this feels the most Elder Scrolls to me, right? Like going through and picking what I want to, what I want to wear and what my character Absolutely. looks like, and like you know, am I going for a whole Elven thing or um, who do I want to be in this world? On your phone whenever you want, but then you also have this element of well, you can go into the arena and play competitively, or you've got this abyss mode. Like there's not just one way to play, but there's just so much content there and so much stuff that you can do that you can just play it literally endlessly. Thanks. Um, so switching gears a little bit, um, I'm a really big Doom fan, have been since I was a kid, um, because my dad let me play that game. Maybe he shouldn't have. That's but it's, a good dad. He's, he is a good dad. But um, I really loved Doom 2016, and I have some questions about Doom Eternal. Uh, mainly, is it a direct sequel? I don't know if that's been said. It has not, and I, I can't really give any more info. Look, it's a sequel because it's the next Doom, but where it sits in the timeline and what the story is, you have to wait till QuakeCon. Okay, so, so more at QuakeCon. One last thing: is it not called Doom Two because you can't keep doing the same Doom names that's, over and over again? That's definitely part of it. We were like, yeah, that's going to be super awkward if every Doom game there was already one called that, and now we got to use years in parentheses. I really wanted to call it Doom Five because I just thought it would be really funny because everybody <laughs> thought the last one was Doom Four, and so let's just jump way ahead and mess with everybody. Kind of like Battlefield One um, to Battlefield Five. But you will actually also find out more about the name and why it's relevant at QuakeCon as it relates to what's going on in the game and the story and so forth. But you know, you know a little bit. Hell on Earth is at least a part of it. Twice as many demons, and definitely a big goal was to make the Doom Marine feel even faster and more aggressive and more powerful. Um, and having played the game a bunch already, I can tell you that all of those things are really, really awesome. Can't wait till August 10th. All right, so QuakeCon it is. I guess on the sequel front and the shooter front, Wolfenstein Youngblood, I think, was one of my favorite uh, announcements. I'm a really big Wolfenstein uh, fan, and I, I reviewed Wolfenstein New Colossus, and um, I'm just really, really looking forward to this story. And, and one of the things I was wondering is it, because Youngblood sounds like a playoff of Old Blood, I was wondering if this is like Wolfenstein if this is a trilogy like has been you know hinted at before is this three or is this more of a no, absolutely separate absolutely not no this is this is separate um you know we, we said we we definitely want to continue the story that we established um with the new order and the new colossus but this is moving things ahead 18 years um after the last game after the new colossus where not only have BJ's twin daughters been born, um, but they're grown up. You see them here in the teaser, and it's about you can play as either one of them and have the other as an AI companion, or if you have a friend that you want to play with, they can play the other twin and you can play through together. But it's still, at its heart, what Wolfenstein is known for, which is interesting characters, ass-kicking Nazis, right? Like, just um, ripping, tash, uh, smashing, tearing through them. Um, in the ways that you would expect in a wolf game. Mm -hmm. And so I guess because you can choose between the twins, do they have slightly different, like, do they feel different to play, different gameplay styles? Mm, we should probably wait till we're... I would love to tell you lots of things about it, but um, uh, we're going to wait a little bit till the team's ready to not only talk more about it, but to actually show you more so you can not just not just hear about it, but actually see, like, okay, I get it. I get the difference. Fair enough. Um, and then I, we haven't even talked about Rage 2 yet. We've talked about a lot of different games. Uh, 
Rage 2 was interesting to me because, you know, you have Andrew WK coming out with that, like, bonkers, off-the-wall song. And then the the gameplay had a similar tone, but it was a little different. I think what I picked up on was, like, the id software shooting style. Yep. And I was wondering, um, you know, is it all going to be, like, balls to the wall? I don't know if I can say that, but, you know, balls to the wall, like, crazy insanity all the time? Or is there going to be a little bit of a, you know, slower, more, not slower, but... It has a certain style to its shooting, and I'm wondering how those tones uh, marry each other. Um, some of that is under your control based on sort of the powers that un you unlock and the way that you play through, but it's really at its core meant to be a crazy, over-the-top, open-world sandbox. Like the id shooter that you know, the way the guns feel, the way the shotguns feel, um, combined with Avalanche's pedigree of creating open worlds and really cool vehicle combat and vehicle driving, um, all of those things combining into, it's just a lot of fun to play however you want. Like if you just want to go exploring around and stumble across content all over the place you can, if you want to follow stories and do quests, you can do that too. Like it's really sort of self-directed what, what do you want it to feel like? You could spend you know, all your time driving around in vehicles and just shooting up other caravans or going into locations. You know, one of my favorite clips in the trailer is when you're engaged in combat with a bunch of guys coming at you and all of a sudden a car just comes flying down the road like right through the midst of them. Like that's what we want it to feel like. It's, it's not one or the other. It's just sort of all happening at once. Um, but it's, it's player directed. So yeah, you could make it as totally crazy as you want it to be then yeah exactly okay um and then another thing i mean this is forgive me for this question but uh, we'll get to prey in a second but you guys announced a uh, dlc for prey the typhoon uh, typhoon hunter not typhoon um i was wondering if we'll see other modes added to other bethesda games similarly uh i, I hesitate to ask about battle royale but i gotta we definitely have nothing battle royale related that's not really been what you know, when people ask me, like, what is Bethesda known for? What does a Bethesda game mean? Well, it can mean all kinds of stuff. It means this. It means the Elder Scrolls Legends card game. It means Fallout 76. Lots of stuff that looks different. But we tend never to want to follow anybody else into a space. We didn't go chasing after Facebook gaming when that was um, the big trend. I, just because Battle Royale is popular doesn't mean it's a good fit for us or our studios. We tend to be more... Uh, informed by what do our teams want to do, what directions do they want to go, how do they want to evolve and grow, both as a studio as far as well as what their games offer. So, like, if somebody comes up with a thing that's Battle Royale or Battle Royale-esque that they think is unique or different or cool, it's probably something we'd consider, but we tend not to go chasing after trends. We kind of want to be pushing ourselves to offer different experiences and, and do new things. Totally understandable. Um, but I guess just any mode, I mean, have, seeing Prey get so much support is really encouraging. That's another game I really love from last year. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like a game like that can be hard to add things to, you mm -hmm. know, in some ways. Um, so I was just wondering if, you know, other games could get, you know, not Battle Royale, but any, any sort of DLC, like new modes sure. like that. Sure, and it sort of varies, Callie, like depending on the thing. So, for example, with The Evil Within, a big one we focused on wasn't necessarily content, but it was making the whole game playable in first person because that felt like a really good fit for that where, like, well, maybe more DLC isn't what folks are looking for. Or in the case of Doom, it was, um, hey, here's this arcade mode, so now you can still play through the game, but now the way that you play through it, it feels very different than just playing through the main single player story that we originally shipped with. So in each case, it's like, let the teams come up with, A, what do they want? B, what are the fans asking for or, or looking for? And then, you know, how do we s surprise and delight them, right? Like they were, they were hoping, I think, for news at E3, but to not only say, hey, here's a big free update you've been waiting for, but here's content and it's all available tonight, go play it right now. Like that, that's what I think is fun to try and exceed folks' expectations and, and to answer and deliver the kinds of things they're looking for. Speaking of surprising and delighting fans, I think uh, we should probably wrap up, but this is my, my final big question is, uh, I want to know what the pitch meeting for uh, Skyrim on Alexa was like, because I thought it was just a joke, and when I found out, I wrote the news story on that, when I found out it actually was on the Alexa store, I lost my mind. <laughs> um, it actually was developed in a very similar way, which was... We know we get a lot of flack for what else are you going to put Skyrim on. So we're like, well, we're just going to own it and have fun with that and make fun of ourselves and make fun of everybody else. 
And this, by the way, was entirely Todd's idea from the beginning. But it just started off as a joke, and then it evolved into, actually, we could make the game that we're joking about and then like just troll them one layer deeper where they think, ha-ha, that's really funny, and the Etch-A-Sketch in the fridge, and then you find out that it's a real thing, and like we got you twice. So it, I don't know. It's one of those things like it started off simple, but like a lot of Todd things, it turned out to be way crazier and more complicated and awesome as a result. Kind of ended up being the ultimate joke so that no one can ever make that joke again. So I think it worked some, very well. Some, something like that, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's all the time we have, I think. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. This has been Pete Hines, Global Senior Vice President of Bethesda. Uh, thank you again. Fantastic show so far. We're really enjoying E3. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. All right. For more on Bethesda, you can check out GameSpot. We have tons of trailers, whole roundup on all the news, all the games announced. So check that out if you missed anything, and we'll see you next time.